In the summer of 2002, the National Association of Scholars released a report of their survey of graduating college seniors, and they wanted to know what have these seniors learned in college regarding ethics and moral behavior. Has college prepared them ethically for their professional lives? Three quarters said yes, they had been taught what is correct. They had been ethically trained, they're ready. And yet, they also said, what is right and wrong depends on differences in individual values and cultural diversity. This means that these students felt that ethical behavior is purely circumstantial and changes from the day to day. And so it still is in 2022. We see this all around us. Relativ relativism is rampant. We need to know more than look at the culture around us to understand the effects of this moral relativism. Whatever I think is right, whatever sounds good to me, well, that must be right and wrong. Never mind God and his law. Unfortunately, this is also the case in the American church as well, or at least in the American church, which, of course, is what happens when you don't read your notes. <laughs> I wonder if anybody noticed that, if I wouldn't have said anything. <laughs> you see, this is the problem also, not in the church universal necessarily, but certainly at least in the American church. How often do we hear about pastors and their moral failures? Adultery, embezzlement, which then brings us to the laissez-faire attitude of Joe Schmo Christian, who just sits in the pew, and on Monday he goes about his life in the same manner as the non-believer to his left or his right. It seems that this is even, even necessarily out of willful disobedience, but rather in ignorance of God's law, of how God expects us to live our lives. You see, the fact is that God has given us his law. The summation of it is the Ten Commandments, and he expects us to obey it. The psalmist well says, the law, is, uh, the law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing to the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. By them is your servant warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. But of course, this brings us to the major rub. Many of us say, well, yes, pastor, that's all well and good, but that's the Old Testament. That's the law. We're under the New Testament. We're the new people of God. We don't have to worry about the law. We have grace. Maybe so. But the New Testament, Jesus' own words say that we are to obey his commands. John tells us that we show God we love him by keeping his commandments. And so these two facts leave us needing to walk a very fine line between obedience and legalism. A super short word on grace because we don't really have time to go down that road. But when we say that we're not under the law, we're under grace, the summation of what that means is that we are not under the law as a form of justification. We are not under the law as an obligation to salvation. We are still under the law as it pertains to moral guidance. The only way to salvation, justification in Jesus Christ. There's several sermons in that alone, so now we're going to move on. <laughs> so we have legalism and antinomianism. Antinomianism is just the idea of the uh, rejection of the law. So legalism robs us of freedom. See, we are free in Christ. We do indeed have grace. God is the God of mercy. We cannot, by our works, ever reach God, nor can we achieve our own salvation. And Paul makes this clear in Galatians 2, 15 and 16. He says, we know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. By the works of the law, no one will be justified. Yet, on the other hand, antinomianism leaves us deciding our own morality to do as we please, which, as we look around us, we can see how well that has panned out. And so we have to find this middle ground, an understanding of our duty to the law as God's people, 
to live obediently to his commands, yet to know the freedom that we have in Christ. That we may be the law-abiding free people who love the law and reject both legalism and license. Indeed, it is, in fact, obedience to the law which gives us freedom. I know it's counterintuitive, uh, but increasingly, even from my own experience, the longer I've walked with the Lord and found joy in his statutes and obedience in his commands, the more freedom I have experienced. It's not the freedom to do whatever we want, especially as Americans, we've come to this idea of liberty as the ultimate good, where we can do literally whatever we want. But that's not real freedom. Real freedom is freedom from the bondage of sin. It's freedom from a life defined by the negative consequences and repercussions of our sinful behavior. I think a helpful quote is Samuel Bolton, he's a Puritan writer. He says, the law sends us to the gospel that we may be justified. And the gospel sends us to the law again to inquire what is our duty as those who are justified. Another thought might be that it is the keeping of the law which is the fulfilling of our purpose as the people of God. The keeping of the law is the fulfilling of our purpose as the people of God. And so therefore, in the Ten Commandments, this is not a list of do's and don'ts to restrict our personal freedoms, make us all poo face. but I want them. Rather, they are instructions for living life, for living the abundant life which Christ came to give us. One preacher helpfully titles them Guidelines to Freedom, and we may well consider them instructions from a loving father. This father looking at us, saying to us, My child, this is how you are to live, so that you will be safe and protected and free. This is how you be the kind of Christian I want you to be. If I may one, say one more thing about the Old Testament and New Testament stuff. We'll, also, we'll often hear that Jesus gave two commands, so that's all I need to worry about. First of all, that's actually not correct. But what he did say is that these two commands, love the Lord your God and love your neighbor, are what all the law and the prophets hinge on. And so, brothers and sisters, our challenge then is to ask how. How do I love the Lord my God, and how do I love my neighbor as myself? And the answer then is found in the Ten Commandments, which themselves summarize the whole law. The first four, commandment one through four, define what it means to love the Lord your God, and they give us practical, actionable ways in which we do that. And then the final six summarize how we love our neighbor. In the same way, they give us actual, practical, doable guidance. Another important use of the Ten Commandments is to show our sin. We know full well that these commandments are not a means to salvation. If you missed it the first time when Paul told us in Galatians, I will repeat myself, no one. Shockingly, no one means no one. Is justified. No one is granted salvation through the works of the law, or in this case, specifically, the keeping of the Ten Commandments. Let's pause. I am hammering this home because I probably won't say it again for five weeks. I don't want anyone to leave at any point in the next five weeks to say, well, Mark just said I have to do this, and then I can get to God. That is not what Pastor Mark said. What Pastor Mark said is, this is how we ought to live. And then when we look at it and we realize how miserably we're failing, we come to the cross and say, Lord Jesus, forgive me. You see, in these commandments, we find the mirror to look at ourselves. This is a reflection of our own sin. It makes plain what we already intuitively know, that we fall short of God's standard. Paul essentially says this in Romans 3.20, Through the law we became conscious of sin. <coughs> uh, to quote Alistair Begg, The Ten Commandments are there not in order to enable us to meet the requirements for God. Only Jesus 
can meet those requirements, but in order to enable us to walk in the fullness and freedom that our Heavenly Father intends. I'm sure that we've all experienced it, if not ourselves, then we've seen the, the meme of the spinach in the teeth, and you sit there and you have a whole conversation with somebody with spinach in your teeth, and then you go use the restroom and you're washing up and you look in the mirror and you're like, oh, how long has that been there? How embarrassing. You see, in the same way the Ten Commandments reflect our sin, as we look at them, we can easily see, oh, how long has that sin been there? How embarrassing. And this is how it is for all humanity. And God has written his law on our hearts. Oh, we'll try again. God has written his law on our conscience, in our minds. His moral law exists in every human being. Now, to varying degrees, from person to person, a person may ignore or not acknowledge or blow off or whatever word you want to say there, God's moral law. But the fact is, he has written it into each one of us. That's how we are created. I would argue it's a part of being created in the image of God. Yet, for a believer, it is not only written in our minds and our conscience, it's also written on our heart. And so as we obey and walk in accordance with these commands, we understand the truth of their wisdom and the freedom which they bring. They drive us to the cross as our sin is made clear. And at that cross, we find love for Christ and a desire to take on his yoke, which is light. In this, we return to the law to understand the way in which we ought to live. And it is the Spirit of God who works within us, both to convince us of this sin and to empower us to overcome it. In all of this, we hear the Savior. We hear the Savior beckon us to himself. He calls us to love the Lord, our God, and our neighbor. And as we reply, how will he answer us with these Ten Commandments that I've given you? And so it is my hope that in this series, you take full advantage of the purposes we've discussed last week to prepare for Lent. That we might prepare well to celebrate our Lord and Savior and his victory, his resurrection. That having examined our own hearts through the lens of God's commandments, through God's moral law, as we prostrate ourselves at the foot of the cross, we again find our first love and a deeper understanding and appreciation of his work on our behalf. One more quick note. I need to give credit to Alistair Beck. He gave a series of sermons on the Ten Commandments that I heard last fall. Um, since that, God has really pressed into my heart that is something I need to share with you all. At the time, I wasn't thinking, oh, this is perfect for Lent. At the time, I was looking at my calendar going, well, I have no idea when this is going to fit into my schedule, uh, our schedule, our preaching schedule. Um, but we'll find a spot. And here we are. Um, so, a large part of this sermon series is based on his series. I want to give credit where credit's due. How's that for an introduction? Are we doing okay? Are we bored yet? Are we tired yet? Are we feeling guilty yet? Let's open our Bibles to Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20. We're going to just do six verses today. Exodus chapter 20. God spoke all these words. I, the Lord, am your God, who brought you from the land of Egypt, from the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourselves a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, earth beneath, water below. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, <coughs> responding to the transgression of the fathers by dealing with children to the third and fourth generations of those who reject me, and showing covenant faithfulness to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. So today we're going to focus on commandment one and two. Hopefully that was clear. I doubt any of us have really considered the depth of what these mean. Surely we all can look at them and say, all right, great. One God, only God. Yep, we got it. Check Raj, we're Christians. Move on. No idols. Got it. No wooden images. Cool. Well, time for lunch. 
<laughs> Yet this misses the significance of what is being said here. Because first and foremost, we see in verse 2, I am. And now recall this is how God first revealed himself to Moses in the burning bush. That I am, that I am. You see, he is. This is the God who existed, created all things that exist. It is he who made you and me. And it is from this position of creator, a sovereign master of the universe, which he has the authority to say, okay, here I am, I am, I am the Lord your God, and you shall. Now, this hits pretty close to home. For me, at least. Because we, I, really don't like to be told what to do. If you aren't sure, you can ask Jennifer. She'll tell you. <laughs> but I think most of us are in this camp. I know I had enough of being told what to do when I was in the Marine Corps. Okay, Lance Corporal. Aye, you... aye, Sergeant. <laughs> now, you all grown folks. I don't include myself, but most of us are in the room. We have a boss. Sad and tell us what to do all the time. I don't want to, but you do it because you have to. Or your spouse, or your elected officials, or whatever. Right? As Americans, we've come to this place where personal liberty is the ultimate good. I just want to do whatever I want, and you leave me alone. And see, the truth is that we are a rebellious bunch of rascals, and we have determined that we are going to do what we want. It seems... The reason for this is that as Christians, we have not settled the matter of who is on the throne. We haven't worked out commandment number one. I am the Lord your God, and you shall. And so, what this commandment is saying will have no other gods before him. It means that you are going to put God first in all things. We'll talk in just a minute about how this ties into the idolatry idea because these are necessarily inextricably linked. That you shall have no other gods before him. So let's talk about who this God is for a minute. Go ahead and verify his authority. What we have in scripture is a statement that God reveals himself as the creator. The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. And so when we stand out in a starlit night, when we look up at the vastness of the heavens, and in our hearts something whispers, something bigger than me did this. And from here we rightly acknowledge with the psalmist, know that the Lord is good, that he made us and we are his. You see, this is the problem with the world out there. Right? They're happy to acknowledge a God, small g, talk about God. But rarely is the God that we hear about the God who exists. The God who made them. The God who made the universe. The God who knows you and me intimately. Who loves them. And he wants a relationship with them. And you and me. And of course, this is the only God that the Bible knows about. This is the Lord who made us, and we are his. You see, he is in charge. Deuteronomy 4.39 tells us, The Lord is God in heaven above and on earth below, and there is no other. You see, the Bible, cover to cover, affirms this over and over again. God is in charge. He is in control. He is the sovereign one. He brings the rain and the drought. He makes the sun shine. He causes the nations to rise and fall to accomplish his ends. And he will not share his glory with another. And it is he who gives and withholds blessings. See, the Lord is God, and there is no other. And so, brothers and sisters, this is for us, of course. We do well to keep this proper view of God. And yet, I wonder if the next time you were in such a conversation with a peer, with a coworker, with a neighbor, that you would be so bold as to say, well, you're talking about a small g God, but God, the creator of the universe, well, the Bible says that there is only one, and he created you. 
And he has a plan and a purpose for your life. And someday you're going to meet him. Maybe you should start living in accordance with his word and what he has for you. And so what does it mean to have no other gods before him? Well, I like, well, I think, and I have heard use the analogy of taking a second wife or a second husband. Most women in the room are probably not eager to do so. You see, it is the breach of an exclusive relationship. God has sought out his people, and he has an exclusive relationship with each one of us individually. He pursued us, he redeemed us, and he is our God. And no other gods may take his place. And yet, when we look at the culture around us, we just see one mess. Our culture is happy to provide numerous gods. I can't remember which reformer who says this, um, Calvin, but basically the the human heart is an idol factory. And we will continue to chase after the idols of our heart until we have established the position of our Lord and Creator. And so if you don't believe me about all of this in our culture, let's consider Mother Earth and the global warming crisis. I guess I need to preface this lest somebody misunderstand. I'm not making a scientific claim here. I'm not a scientist and I don't care. But here's the thing. Global warming is the new religion. You see, we must worship the earth. We are called to make sacrifices to her, giving up fossil fuel, fuels, not eating meat. We have to appease her so that she doesn't wipe us all out. Quite a vengeful God, it seems. You see, these people who are preaching this, these men and their women who are so smart, they're so educated, educated themselves out of knowing God, as we heard in Sunday school this morning. They claim to be so scientific and rational, and yet they've reverted back to these pagan gods of old and just worship with a new twist. We've ceased to believe in the God of the Bible. We don't believe in anything anymore because we've started to believe as a society in everything. And it's not that these people don't believe in God, uh, but rather they believe in gods. And it, it is any belief in these gods that means we're not believing in the God of the Bible. And that's what the first commandment is all about. And so as we take a look in the mirror, so to speak, who among us profession Christians have, have we accepted the lordship of God in our whole lives? And so what I mean is this. We readily give God those things which we want to, particularly our burdens and our troubles and things are going wrong, and we're ready to say, okay, God, help me. But what about your work life? Are you serving God or are you serving man? Are you serving money? Is God Lord of your relationships? Have you put him in charge of your friendships, of your marriage, of your professional relationships? How about your personal finances? How about your free time? If I look at your calendar, what am I going to see? So something that you're readily going to say, okay, pastor, have at it. Not that my opinion matters, it doesn't. I have my own problems. Have you given all of these things over to another deity, whether it is self or man or money or whatever? Or is the God of creation, the only God, the God who loves you, the Lord of your life? To the degree which I allow anyone or anything else to make my decisions, I am violating the first commandment. And how often do we put these things, which might even seem good, before him? You see, I find myself wrestling with this concept, too. How often do I put my duty as pastor before my personal relationship with my Lord? When do we put our marriages or families in the place that it is reserved for God alone? I want to give a specific example. 
<clears throat> I'm first going to say the problem with the small church. I'm going to give this example, and I guarantee you at least two of you in this room are going to go, he's talking about me. No, I'm not. I can't keep track of all your stuff. I can keep track of my own life. But here it is. It's the concept of, we better be done at church at 12 noon, Pastor Mark. We better wrap that sermon up. We got family time. We got dinner to get to. We got... Who's the Lord of your life? Hey, family's important. I know we have in-laws. Maybe you just need to tell that in-law, hey, God's more important than you. And we'll get there when we'll get there. We'll be there. But y'all are just going to have to wait. Keep the roast hot. Figure it out. I don't know. Anyway, there you have it. Whatever it is in your life that you're putting these small G gods in place of the, the king of the universe, the big G God who is on the throne. I'm not saying that family isn't important. I'm not saying that work doesn't matter. I'm not saying that sometimes we are at the end of ourselves and our relationships going, I don't know. What am I supposed to do, God? How do I honor you in this lose-lose situation? What I am saying is that when we cease to seek him first, we have put a little g-god in his place. And we have ceased obeying the first commandment. The fact of the matter is, we will all serve something. I sure hope that it's the big g-god. I'm going to paraphrase the last little bit of Joshua. He says, uh, choose whether you will serve the Lord God or the gods of your forefathers served beyond the river or the gods of the pluralistic Americans who are all around you. Those whose land you are living in, you sure resemble an awful lot. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. And this is what the first commandment is calling us to do to serve the Lord, only Him, and holy Him. And so this segues into the second commandment well, which probably means more than what you think it is, because, like I said, it gets to this, no idols. It's directly related to commandment one. No other gods, nothing should become between us and Him. And commandment two then says, no carved images of any likeness in heaven or on earth. Or in the seas below, because apparently I can't read today. <clears throat> but it is here that we get mixed up. It's the image part, because we get this idea of idols. Okay, got it. These pagan shrines, false deities, weird bird beaks with a human body. Oh, check Raj. Got it. None of those. But it's more than that. So let me paraphrase 2 Kings 10 to help us with this. Jehu uh, is going to destroy all of the Baal worship. And he comes up with a plan. These people are worshiping Baal, they're building temples, they have their poles, they're doing the things. Direct idolatry. Directly worshiping other deities, small g gods. And so he comes up to a, with a plan to take care of this, and it's quite gory and gruesome, so I'll spare the details that I'm preaching on it today. If you want to read it, 2 Kings chapter 10, it's a good read. We get to verse 26. And the author tells us they brought the sacred stone out of the temple of Baal and burned it, they being the Israelites under Jehu's command. They demolished the sacred stone of Baal and tore down his temple. And the people have used it for a latrine to this day. You see, so Jehu was concerned, rightly, that they wouldn't be worshiping the wrong god, in this case Baal. But he wanted to make sure that everybody worshiped the right god. So far, so good. Commandment one, check Raj. Now, verse 28 says something very interesting. Jehu destroyed Baal worship it in, in Israel. However, don't miss this. This is the interesting, important part. He did not turn away from the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, which he had caused Israel to commit. Namely, the worship of the golden calves at Bethel and Dan. And so if you're unclear on the golden calves, just know that they were a means by which people were worshiping the Lord. So the intent with the golden calves was not to worship another god, small g, but rather to worship Yahweh, the real God, through a means of these calves. And so Jehu was clear there is only one true God who was to be worshipped. 
But what he was unclear on, incorrect in, was assuming that we can worship that God any way that we wanted to, in this case by the construction of these calves. What we need to understand is that idolatry consists not only of worshiping other gods, false gods, but also of worshiping the triune God in false ways. There are specific manners, uh, means by which we are prescribed to worship. This is what the Bible tells us, with a proper focus on who worship is about. And so here, we worship in prescribed ways. To the glory of God, to the best of our abilities in spirit and in truth. And now this whole thing with the images of God has a long, long history. It's been quite touch, touchy within the church. Thomas Aquinas pointed out that people are more easily moved by what they see than what they read or hear. All the time you hear people say things like, well, we should use drama, or we should have this image, or we should have this artistic thing, or we should use videos, or we should... Because after all, far more will take place in an instant than what people see or experience than will take place in an hour and a half of reading the Bible. <clears throat> so first of all, I don't think this is true. But even if it is true, there may indeed be more impact in the feelings of a person, depending on the culture and what's being done, uh, but in terms of God revealing himself, it's not so. See, we confuse worship for a warm, fuzzy feeling in here. But worshiping God is not about your feelings or your experience. Worshiping God is about the one on the throne. More to point here regarding the images, Isaiah <coughs> helpfully offers us, to whom will you liken God? What likeness will you compare him to? And see, the implied answer is no one and nothing, because he is so great. Although a finite mind can't. And so God is telling us we can't approximate him. So rather than looking for sculptures and paintings, we need to look in his word for how he has chosen to reveal himself. Interestingly, even in the um, incarnation, there is no record of what Christ looked like. The Bible doesn't tell us, was Jesus six foot or six two or five eight? He had brown hair and blue eyes, or brown eyes and blonde hair. Be an interesting conversation. But it's not there. There's no other figure in recorded history that this is true of. And yet God left these details out on purpose. So we wouldn't be able to create a likeness of Christ. And so the punchline here is that it is important because images dishonor God and they misdirect men. See, the real problem with statues is that we can't fully or accurately represent God. No matter how good they are, how grand or wonderful they may be, they inevitably conceal most of, at least part of, who God is and his grandeur. Any kind of image we create whether crucifixes or otherwise, cannot depict God in all of his fullness. And the truth about God is revealed to the extent he chose in his word and in his son, Jesus Christ. And so the misdirection of men follows from these images that can't properly represent God correctly. Let us go back to the golden calf incident in Exodus 32 that I just referenced. The idea is that the people wanted to worship God. They were scared. And the calf is a symbol of strength and virility. And so, worshiping through this image, what they were trying to say is God is like this calf because he is strong and powerful. So, they had the proper motivation. But of course, we know the story, and the story quickly takes a hard left turn as they quickly fall into all sorts of wrong pagan practices and rituals. And these men and women were misdirected. <clears throat> so too, hopefully to a lesser degree, when we worship God in ways that he did not prescribe in his word, we find ourselves in trouble. And this brings us to our relationship with God. God says he's a jealous God. Now I know that we, like good modernists who watch Oprah, can't tolerate this idea of a God who is jealous. In our heads we have the envious boyfriend. 
dare I say, borders on abuse or is abuse. And we've confused <coughs> envy, which we are not to have, with jealousy. See, the jealousy in view here is not necessarily a negative. It's the way that a husband looks at his wife, not in a controlling, abusive way, but in a caring and protective way, in a way that is not going to share her with anybody else. Now, my husband's in the room. I would pose to you, are you going to share your wife with another? I can tell you that I will not. And so God says, I am a jealous God, and I will not share you. If you try to make me share and you disobey me, then there are going to be consequences which will follow onto your children and their children and so on and so forth. But see, really, this is just a statement of cause and effect. Because as we turn our backs on the laws of God and do whatever we want, yeah, we're going to suffer bad consequences. The inverse is also true. And those who live according to his statutes will be blessed from generation to generation. And now y'all are smart thinking individuals. I hope that this is thought provoking. We want to obey these commandments. Yet we also want to imagine God. We want to know God. We want to draw near to God. We want to have a relationship. We want to experience him. We want to be intimate with him. And so how do we get close to him? We're at an impasse. And yet God knows this, and so he sent us his son, who is, as Colossians tells us, the fullness of the Godhead, dwelling in bodily form. And we are complete in him. And so God has drawn us to him. He has come down to us, revealed himself to us in the person of his son, so that all of our encounters with him would be there with his son, Jesus. And how would we know this Jesus except that he has been revealed in his word? And anything and anyone that encourages us to worship the correct God incorrectly is a great detriment to our spiritual life and progress. And so I say all that to say, to leave us with this question of what does all that mean? Well, that's what we have to work out. The Bible talks about work out your faith with fear and trembling and obedience to the Lord. As Jesus said, this is eternal life, that they might know the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you sent. And Jesus also says, he who has seen me has seen the Father. What a tragedy to embrace a picture, a crucifix, a statue, a painting, and to miss the person To sit at a shrine and to miss our Savior. And to worship a statue and to miss the Lord Jesus Christ. And so here we find our application for the week. If you are journalers, journal on. If you're not, find a piece of paper. Spend time working this out. Spend time examining those things in your life which you have not given to the Lord. Write them down and invite that him into those areas. Or oh, that's hard. I know. It's an extremely uncomfortable task. <clears throat> that's your application for the week. Hopefully, it will help us to further understand God's mercy and grace and how much he loves us as we invite him into every area of our lives. And so in the chaos the moral relativity that we find ourselves in, God has given us clear instructions of how we are to live in the Ten Commandments. This law is not a list of do's and don'ts, but it's a guideline for freedom. As we seek to know our God and grow into the likeness of his Son, we know that the Lord is God. He is the one and only. We shall have no other gods before him, and we shall worship him and him alone as he has prescribed. Would you pray with me? Lord God, thank you for revealing yourself to us in the way that you have seen fit. Help us to write your statutes on our heart that we may experience the freedom we have in your son, Jesus Christ. Let us examine our hearts this week to see where we have 
place small g gods in place of you. Lord, forgive us. <clears throat> Help us to welcome you into every area of our life, that we would have no other gods before you, and that we would worship you and you alone in spirit and in truth for your glory. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, and the power of your Spirit. Amen.